often they are either, they're like in some sort of hidden away area, whether it's like an alleyway or behind a building. Often you have to find the place. We don't want a business. We're not running a business. We want to be able to have some crazy like events and good gig parties. That's all we want to do. Big bands didn't start from nowhere. They don't just show up and play at Mass Hall. The real estate boom means condos now dominate Toronto cityscape. Established artists have seen its club scene wither over the years. I know we'll find a way. When we grew up, we came out of, of the 90s sort of hip hop scene and house music scene. and. There was just so much more DIY stuff. There was warehouse parties. Stuff was affordable. You could live here and work part time. And just over the over the 18, 20 years that we've lived here, we've just seen it become so expensive. I think we're having a reverse of like when poor and working class and immigrant folks and artists lived in cities, and then people lived in the suburbs if you had money. So that's we're actually seeing the shift of that. So I kind of laugh about it to be like, we're just going to move to the suburbs. <laughs> <laughs> the shift means artists are being pushed out of what used to be cheap industrial land. I don't think we always have to buy a revolution. At the same time, I don't think we Literally look at any of the stuff that used to be where Liberty Village is now. And that was where the entire after hours scene of Toronto existed for the most part, right through all the way to the East End. You know, like there was the biggest clubs in the city, like the government and places like that, that got pushed out for condo development. In the last year, the list of vanished venues grew. Silver Dollar Room, The Hideout, Not My Dog, Harlem, and The Hoxton closed shop. The Central in Mervish Village will be torn down to make way for residential buildings along with iconic Honest Ed's. Hughes Room is still hanging on, but closed for several months and had to reopen as a non-for-profit venue. You know, like it's kind of all over the place. This is a techno collection that I bought off of some other Toronto DJs that have stopped playing because they're so frustrated with the landscape of it. Brooklyn's gone through the exact same problems that Toronto went through, but they went through them 10 years ago. And I mean, it kind of makes sense that, you know, Toronto is the city that wants to be New York. A lot of the music that happens here is stuff that's not, you know, it doesn't have a huge stage. It's things that people are trying out. The Holy Oak, a queer-friendly hangout in the West End, closed in February, only a few days after our visit. Few venues like it exist in Toronto. Holy Oak is kind of a lot of things to a lot of different communities, whether it be people playing uh, funk or uh, jazz on a Tuesday or DJs. Um, Sometimes we have big queer parties where people come and, you know, just express themselves. But the rent doubled in eight years. The owners threw in the towel. Rent control exists for residential people, but like for a business, if, if, the, land, if the landlord wants to raise the rent $3,000 or a million or anything, once the contract's over, they can do whatever they want. To fill the gap, artists can turn to DIYs. Spaces not necessarily built to be music venues, like apartments, warehouses, or art galleries. They're much cheaper and vital to the fabric of the creative scene. You come into the space and you're like, oh, there's a regular kitchen, a regular bathroom. You realize it's sort of a house, an apartment, right? When people are here for the first time, it's like, oh, it's a really weird, interesting apartment. We're in someone's house, you know? And it's like, but there's a mini ramp, you know? and. Um, and there's this really awesome band playing in this mini ramp inside this really weird house. Often they are either they're like in some sort of hidden away area, whether it's like an alleyway or behind a building or just, yeah, somewhere unique that isn't the regular, you know, uh, bar uh, window. 
um, venue sign, big lineup. Some of our biggest Canadian exports, music-wise, have started in DIY spaces and in small grassroots spaces. Grimes and like Arcade Fire. When bigger bars have no room for us to play, or have never heard of us before, it's these smaller DIY spaces and grassroots venues that have like taken us in with open arms and have housed us and fed us and like showed us around town. DIY spaces are built by and directly serve marginalized communities, but they can be illegal and some promoters prefer to stay anonymous. And I started throwing parties because I wanted to provide a space for women, for sort of more, for people of color and for LGBTQ people. We just don't post the venue on Facebook. Not anything that's public. And then we'll email people who buy tickets the address. So the ghost ship fire happened in Oakland, right? December 2nd, 2016. A fire breaks out in a massive DIY space in Oakland, California. 36 people die. It would kind of send out an alert amongst the North American DIY community. It's like, holy crap, this is awful. Shortly after, online trolls from the ultra-right-wing message board 4chan start a crusade against DIYs, which they describe as open cesspools of radicalism and liberal degeneration. They compile a list of DIYs and report them to authorities. And at some point, a lone GTA participant um, uh, offered up soy bomb. He's like, oh, there's one of these places in my city too. But then, early January, um, 8.30, 9.30 in the morning, uh, uh, fire inspectors at her door. The Toronto Fire Department orders the closure of Soy Bomb, a well-known Toronto DIY. The venue does not comply with fire safety standards and zoning laws. Shortly afterwards, Double Double Land in Kensington Market suffers the same fate, even though they had safety measures in place. Our curtains are like sprayed with fire retardant. We have like an extinguisher on stage, we have an extinguisher like at the back of the room. Um, and we even have like an exit sign. It's becoming like Manhattan or something. Like Manhattan is just, culturally speaking, other than the big institutions is like dead. They're really nervous now, and since the soy bomb closure, like since it hit home in Toronto, now everyone is just completely on edge, I find, without naming any of the venues, but a lot of the venues that were flying under the radar, um, that were given a free pass by Toronto, and are really like staples of this neighborhood in Kensington Market, or just a lot of the like young neighborhoods, they are, they're not working right now, which is really unfortunate. Artists are leaving, you know, I have friends moving to Hamilton. I mean, the consequences of not having, nurturing that sort of cross-cultural dialogue or creating safe spaces for people of color or the gay community or trans community or super straight community, being able to nurture ideas is that you end up with like very homogenous culture. And unfortunately, that's what I feel is happening in Toronto. You know, when you look at rap music, the biggest purveyor of street culture is a child actor from Forest Hills. Like, that's crazy to me, you know? Even before those things start getting exposed, communities of color have always been in danger. You know, whether they were even queer or not, like hip hop shows in the 90s were massive and then they got shut down because they were too big. And they're, too, you know, it scared, it scared people. Some DIYs, however, do operate legally. Um, we program monthly between November and March. Um, we're an inter-arts festival. Um, came originally out of the punk and DIY scenes in Toronto. Um, for the past four years, we operated successfully out of the Great Hall. Um, this year, we lost our space at the Great Hall, and now we're currently um, we're homeless. We float around. Their events are open to people of all ages, a rare feat in Toronto. Long Winter received accolades from Rolling Stone and Pitchfork, but the DIY festival struggles to survive. Partly because we function with a volunteer staff, we didn't have the capacity to apply for every single possible grant last year. Oakland, who like uh, pledged, you know, whatever, 1.3 million to bringing existing DIY spaces up to code and whatnot, like, uh, 
I don't see anything like that happening here. Can they do some kind of a rent control like system for, you know, music venue owners, for example? Um, what can we do about nimbyism, like people who move downtown and then complain about the noise? Then cities just don't understand them. Like they really don't get them. So they, they get a complaint from a neighbor and in typical, you know, municipal government fashion, they come out with like this arsenal of people. But the city is starting to take notice. In 2015, it designated the Silver Dollar as a heritage site to save it from being demolished. But there's no guarantee it'll reopen as a live music venue. Toronto Music Industry Advisory Council is studying ways to salvage those that are left. Let's look at zoning. Where can you uh, have certain businesses? Could you have music clubs in, in employment areas that typically they weren't allowed in before. Uh, does the zoning rules right now almost encourage condo development that, that kicks out locally owned businesses, music or otherwise? Should there be tax credits or different tax assessments for arts and cultural venues like music? Most large growing cities face the same challenges. Between 2007 and 2015, London lost 35% of its venues to gentrification and because of strict zoning and noise rules. It has since loosened those rules and introduced a series of measures to facilitate the creation of new venues. If you want real culture, you have to pay for it, you know? And other cities do that. I feel like that's a band-aid solution. Uh, getting tax credits, it's like, oh, here's some money, here's like $200 a month or whatever. Like, great, thanks for that, but like, how is that gonna measure up to these like real estate developers who have, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. People that basically work their jobs, go home, watch TV, and have kids and whatever. They do their thing. Maybe a lot of them don't understand that, like, the people that are providing them with this richness of, of culture, it, it starts somewhere, you know. It doesn't just appear. It starts in places like this, or like Double Double Land, or the Transac. And um, without them, you know, the arts are suffocated and cities become really boring. I think we'll become closer to what Vancouver is right now and just open up a lot of space for condo building and restaurants. Um, and one day we'll wake up and like a large part of Music City Toronto will be, won't exist. Thank you.